give a little bit in, you know, my perspective, and, and then hopefully it's helpful to some folks uh, who are newer here. So, so Hermosa Hills, really what, you know, the predominant choices of people going over there, you're out showing property, uh, are larger lots, bigger homes, relative to other parts of Hermosa, and the opportunity for, for some really, really nice views. Um, so, you know, you talk to people who are looking for a house with a yard and views, you know, do not forget some of the options that come up. And I'll talk about a couple challenges when you're looking for options here. So, next one, Ian. So, obviously, a couple different product choices. You have uh, the condos, that, uh, the most predominant one being the Victorian 2411 Prospect. Uh, entry level, you have the uh, single family homes that are running the million inch range. There, the one on Hillcrest, you have a little dumplet, as Jack would call it, there on Prospect. And then you have a nice a newer home with some big views, a little bit bigger lot. This was a home that Kirsten Cole sold uh, right at the end of last year. So the borders that uh, we're all pretty familiar with uh, street borders of Artesia, PCH, and uh, Kind of 190th, although some of the houses on 190th, they're actually in Redondo, and then the border of uh, North Redondo there to the east. Go ahead in. So uh, the zoning map again. If you remember when we were talking about the sand section, there was a collage of different colors, and you can see that uh, Hermosa Hills. This is PCH right here. So everything to the, to the east there is almost predominantly R1. So it's vastly, uh, that's the majority of it. It's all single family homes. You see the orange here, here, down there on 5th, 6th, and 8th Street. Those are townhome opportunities that you will find. Um, to that point, um, if you're selling a townhome up there, it can be a challenge to appraise because there's such a little turnover of that product type. Uh, one I had last year, I really had to explain to the appraiser that they had to come across PCA where you had to really understand that it was a single family home option and had to look at the values of similar square footage single family homes. So you will have challenges of crazy townhomes in that area sometimes. Go ahead, Andy. Um, mentioned this, uh, the pockets of the townhome area, larger lots, uh, talked about that. There's you know a lot of different sizes over the typical 2400 square foot sand section lot but you do get some selected areas where you have nice 50 by 100 lots that people really like you do the yard space sometimes even views in the, the bigger homes uh, keep in mind you get some good city views in some of the locations i'll point out one up here um, what i was saying is when you're looking at stuff in a price point of let's just say a million one million two you're looking at townhomes in the sand or in hermosa valley or even in smaller homes in Manhattan Beach, you may go, well, let's see what's over there, and there may be nothing. But that doesn't mean something doesn't, it's such a small inventory that sometimes there isn't one of every kind of product over there. So keep it, you know, you gotta keep your eye on it if you're looking for a price point, they say, in Manhattan or most because they don't, they're not always out there to pick them. Um, and then uh, I mentioned the townhome market, you know, if you're showing west of PCH, Hermosa Valley, the, all the townhomes, the tuna lots that are there, you really, people say, oh, I don't want to be west of PCH or east of PCH. You say, well, you, you get better views. And what people don't realize is uh, virtually all of Hermosa is closer to the beach than mo most of Manhattan Beach that's west of PCH, just the way PCH runs there. So you're in Hermosa Hills, you're closer to the beach than you are in Elm in the tree section. Uh, so. It's hard for people to sometimes understand that. All right, go ahead. Uh, current activity, uh, 12 listings, 12 in backup and pending. Uh, one of the listings is out there is a short sale. You can see that there's distress there. There's been 15 sales since January 1st. Uh, there was nine in 2011. This was a little interesting, so this kind of speaks to the limited choices, is the average of the sales in the median, 874, 764. Last year it was a million one and a million one fifty. That's pretty deceptive because there was just bigger homes, different product types that traded. It wasn't that the same houses were more expensive or less expensive this year. Um, 
you see the average price of the actives and the median. Um, this is the average days on market. And you take, there's two very long dated DOMs on there. If you add those in, it goes up to 100. So I pulled out the outliers, as they say. So that's the more typical days on the market. All right. Um, the sales, just comparing uh, last year to this year, um, you can see you know, I'm going to jump in this year's sale on single family homes, just happen to be the you know the smaller, older homes that have traded. Uh, last year there was seven sales over a million. Seven of the nine of these, seven of them were over a million. And this year there's been five. Um, and there's only two active properties over a million. So again, speaking to the very, very uh, slim inventory. Actually, there's going to be one more coming back on the market here. I'll speak to that uh, Talked about the schools before. There's the school site. Been familiar. Hermosa View is up there in Hermosa Hills on 17th and Prospect. Many people like uh, going up to buy their first homes up there because it is close to the school there. You have access to the school playground and outdoor space to make use of. Many uh, buyers who look around up there really do like that aspect of being close to school. All right. Andrew. Entry level properties we talked about. Uh, this is a short sale pending in the Victorian, two bed, two bath for three and a quarter. A condo on Fifth Street, 1,300 feet, two bedroom, one and a half for six. 19. This is actually a nice little smaller complex. This is the Dumplet, and $5.99. Actually, pretty cute. Um, on the corner of 9th and Prospect, which is challenging, but a uh, single family home for 600 grand. It um, fell out, of course, it went in escrow, it fell out, kind of bad appraisers. So that is back active. No, I can't figure that out. Oh, they did figure that out. Okay, thank you, Ralph. I'll be coming to you again. Uh, Golden, that was a uh, trust sale on a nice large lot. Um, they came out at 650. Uh, I think that's going to settle around 800. I think it had about 10 or 11 offers. A lot that actually supported two townhomes. Although I know many people were looking at it for a single family home. It's a really nice location. Then you have the mid price properties around that million, million one range. Uh, this is Julie Christensen's uh, property on the market there uh, on 17th. You have this home that just traded. Rob, just let me know this was full price. Not a big home, so a little surprising, but actually pretty good location uh, on that larger, you know, larger lot, almost 5,000 feet. I was on the market for three weeks. This uh, property on Hillcrest, there, I don't know, that's not right. It's actually two better, two and a half back. You know, there's two million dollar sales a couple doors away. Same square footage, same year built, same views. But these people remodeled the house, made it a two bedroom. They took the two bedrooms downstairs, and made it a big master. So I think they're they got a big challenge with that. Uh, if they, and it's not easy to make it back into two bedrooms the way they did it. So, uh, but a good street, good location will be interesting to see where that settles. This was one of the better deals. I thought uh, that came out at 970 or 985, something like that. Um, this is on 7th Street, 17th Street and Cola Sack, right by the school, and looked out to the east. The views from that house, you can see the Hollywood sign all the way down to Long Beach. Saddleback Mountain that day. You had a huge view. Uh, not a big house, a little uh, older, built in the 70s. Uh, but had five offers sold for a million sixty. Not many homes come up on that little cul-de-sac. And then you have the uh, higher end of the market, which for this area in this current market environment is approaching a million five. It's been a while since that uh, home sold over a million five up there. Uh, although it did happen on a number of occasions a few years back. Uh, this was the one first Cole sold for a million four seventy five. Um, really good street on 9th Street, nice views, a little bit of yard space. This was a really nice, uh, essentially custom home on Corona, Lane 350, that was the last year. This was the last new construction single family home uh, that sold last month for a million four and a quarter. I don't even know the price, but a million four twenty five is on the market, a million four ninety nine for a long time. Um, so we just held tight. They got a good, pretty good number, I think. And then this is eighth place. This was a really cute, redone, 
uh, older home, but just dialed into the nines as far as, and then we did the kitchen and bath, very cottage, cottagey feel. Um, and that was on the market, had multiple offers, if I remember correctly, when it first came out, a million two forty nine. Again, a, a nice spot on uh, eighth place, that nine hundred block of eighth place, ninth, tenth street. Um, so those are all really nice uh, streets, uh, wide streets, sidewalks, very desirable for a lot of people close to town. Um, anyway, but so a couple of recent sales. Again, we talked to this was I, I thought that probably could have priced a little bit higher. Uh, I'm not sure how much more it would have gotten. But it had five offers. I, I think this was a real good deal, even though they, you know, had to bid up. Um, I think you could have priced it at or near that, just to that location is so perfect for a lot of people. Golden, I thought that was a really good deal as well. Really nice lot. You built a home. Um, you'd have great views uh, from from kind of the eastern part of the lot, uh, or two townhomes. Really good spot. Got a block away from uh, Mr. Hermosa Hills, Rob McGarry, but that's a disclosure for someone else. <laughs> uh, First Street, this was a townhome we talked about uh, actually this week. These uh, sold for, I think, 725, uh, 900 block of First Street. Um, Hannah was making a comment, he's trading close to a million one. And newer, shows pretty nice. Next door, sold, and they're built, they built big ones. To that point, yeah. So just east or just west of this property is a new development um, coming up. But in, um, so our friends at Trend Graphics give us this information. This is for the last uh, year. So you can see the steady decline. This is only for most of the hills. Sales are pretty, you know, stable relative to you know one, two, five years. You know, Straightforward, but this is a 10 year trend, and you can just see the trend of limited inventory speaking to what uh, Leslie Appleton Young. It's very, very much uh, the case over there, and sales numbers you know, relatively stable and in a similar range. So, going forward, uh, the low inventory, um, there's definitely upward pressure on the right properties. You know, there's a the property going to come back on the market at 12, 1220, excuse me, 1245.20th place that Dan O'Connor had at three offers at a million three fifty forty nine. Um, went in, it's uh, actually coming back out. We just going to see what happens, you know, that momentum's lost. But when you have good properties like that, that was. A big house on a bigger lot and a nice spot on 20, 20th place. Um, expect multiple offers to tell your clients this is a very small micro market and if they like it, chances are there's a lot of other people who like it too because there aren't a lot of choices for good good properties. Um, distressed properties are still small, you know, real 20% factor, but again, that's a little bit misleading too because there's one of these kind and one of those kind and uh, there's opportunities though. There was one at uh, 1118 7th Street that had been out for 900 for a year plus and then they keep brought it down to in the 8s as a short sale. Didn't sell, they dropped it to 760 last weekend at five offers and they were sending some to the bank. Someone's going to get a pretty good deal. Um, extremely limited new construction. This was just checked with Rob. The only spec development in the hill, uh, most of the hills, is the townhomes at the 900 block of First Street that we just talking about. Hannah said, uh, four units, Gary Evelyn, he's going to have, those are, per, and he's going to price them at a million plus, which is, you know, probably rich, but who knows right now. Uh, you'll see some other developments, some uh, custom home builds being done, owner users building on them. Uh, keep an eye on the uh, school solution. Um, again, that parcel tax may come to a vote in November. Saw some information recently, may get pushed off the next year. And the uh, ballot vote, again, for McPherson drilling suit is scheduled for this November, uh, as I understand it. Um, saw these pictures before, but again, you see this is the north part of the Hermosa Hills here. You can see uh, the downtown area look pretty similar, but going far east, not a lot of development there. And then, pitching, Oklahoma, great community event going on this weekend at the Hermosa Beach Playhouse. 
couple of South Bay Brokers uh, offspring are performing. Susan Gailey's son is Judd in four of the shows. Ted Craddock's daughter Jen is Ada Randy in a show, and my son Don is uh, Will in one of the shows. It's a family group uh, in Hermosa Beach. They do a really good job. It's a fun show. So come on by and enjoy Oklahoma. If anybody is uh, shopping in that uh, Hermosa Hills area, I'm always turn to Dunham or Rob McGarry and a few people in the office here really can share some great insight into the properties up there. Good job. Um, we also are, uh, have uh, Adam. Uh, I was going to do this. So it's John Star Lunch and Learn. I'm going to mention it because John's a very good friend of mine and I'll be meeting there at noon. For 1230, 130, very predominant architect in our area, and really, really good resource um, for new home builds or remodels. So that's today, 1230 to 130. Make it Manhattan Beach office. Uh, okay, lunch and learn today. I'm starting <laughs> Okay, all right. Uh, but Adam Wilson is here from the office. Uh, those of you that uh, had an opportunity to work with Adam, doing a great job, really been helping out with uh, getting people organized with uh, ads, ads, flyers, and, and all. But he's also here just to give us a few minutes on uh, on photography and how to take great pictures. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the reason that management asked me to do this meeting, I mean this uh, presentation, where there's also a class that some of you have been to was uh, to serve the purpose that you cannot use a photographer and you need to take your own photographs for your own properties. These are just some tips, general tips and composition tips that you can use that are pretty practical. You don't have to have a nice camera to do this. You can use even the camera phone um, solution. So let's get started. Yeah. Okay, so, so just some general tips here. Uh, you'd be surprised how much these issues come up. These are things that even professional photographers really need to pay attention to, but first thing, make sure your lens is clean. This is a big deal. You don't know how many photos I've seen with thumbprint, uh, you know, a little droplet of moisture that's dry, something like that. Um, turn your flash off, don't, don't, just don't use it. It's never good enough to not make your photos look washed out. It's just never good. Okay, and the more megapixels, the better. Um, at least five is gonna be required for anything that's gonna be print worthy. Um, and no MLS photos are not good enough to print. Just saying that, okay? Okay, uh, some more general tips. When you want to take different depths of field in your shots, um, it's better just to walk, to physically walk where you want the uh, composition to look, instead of zooming. The reason of, of that being that the more that you zoom, the more shaky the camera is going to be. And so the more opportunity for a loss of focus is going to happen. Um, it's just a good uh, practice to steady your stance in any way that you can. You can lean against something like this and then take your photo. Um, also, just this is, this is almost like a, a gun shooting tip. Um, press the shutter button at the end of an exhale, not as you're intaking breath. <laughs> These are things to uh, keep your, yourself steady. And then one last thing is hold the camera about right here. Not out at arm's length. This is another thing that you're going to have motion track happening to again make your photos fuzzy without it being um, just able to keep it steady. Okay, so I'm going to do some tips about uh, composition from the outside of the properties and then the inside. So, one of the biggest things that you can get is time of day. Um, you can see right here that uh, these are both morning and afternoon shots, which are always going to be the best. And the biggest thing that you need to uh, pay attention to is what 
time of day, whether it's in the morning or afternoon, that your property is going to look the best. And the way that you figure that out is you position yourself between the sun and your property. So the sun should always be at your back, and so you should be in the middle. So basically the sun is going to be illuminating the outside of your property. So you need to figure out if it's a property facing um, east, then you're going to want to take it in the morning because the sun will be in the east and not behind it, which will be backlit. So, Andy, go to the next slide. <clears throat> you can see right here, this is the difference of the properties. Same property, but in the morning versus the uh, afternoon. What we're trying to avoid is the light sky. This is always what makes your property look bad. In addition, to that, it's being backlit, so everything's in shadow right here, whereas everything in the morning is illuminated. And this is stuff that you can um, easily control. You just have to set it up ahead of time. Um, another tip when you are taking shots from the outside is just to take different perspectives. Um, I know a lot of people prefer the straight on front view, but sometimes you can capture some architectural feature or something of interest if you do a, a three-quarter view from the right or the left. Uh, another thing that you can do to maximize the amount of what you want to be in the frame is to use vertical lines um, through other architectural features or trees or poles or something like this little planter wall, something like that. But the point is, is you want to make a 90 degree angle based off of whatever is the most, um, yeah, what I said, just the, the vertical element that is the closest to you in your depth of field, basically. You want to use that to, to ground your photo because I get a lot of photos that are, that are crooked. And so when I have to rotate that, sometimes I have to trim off the corners and you lose some aspect of the photo that you want to be in there. You lose anywhere from 10 to 20% of it to, depending on how bad the correction needs to be. Okay, now to inside composition tips. What I would say is the biggest thing that you need to realize is that you're losing your depth of field and you're losing your peripheral vision when you're taking a photo. So, what, why that's important is that a lot of times it's hard to convey the size of the interior space of what you're trying to shoot without using some kind of tricks, I guess you could say. Because the whole thing is you're turning a three-dimensional space into a one flat static plane. So, what you need to do is try to convey some sense of what people are looking for. Um, so to do that, to get the side of the space, the best idea is to get uh, three walls in the frame, and that creates a good sense of perspective. Versus if you're just looking at one corner of a shot, it's really it's really hard to understand what you're looking at, and it's hard to, I guess you could say, just sell the room itself. So you can see both of these uh, shots are the same room. One is taken from this perspective at the door, and then another is taken from this perspective in the corner here. So what you can do is you can just back yourself up, and then you get both, you know, options, but you have the three walls that are the... Anyway, the, basically the point is, is if you weren't getting these three walls in there, you're not going to get a size um, kind of uh, perspective of what's going on in this room right here. Okay, then the opposite is think small. Um, what, what happens is if you get lost somewhere in the middle between thinking big and thinking small, then it just usually ends up being a uh, boring shot. So the other, the other idea is just to focus on interesting details and cut out the areas that aren't so interesting. Both of these, you can, especially when you're presenting a property in a flyer or an ad or something like that, if you have the juxtaposition of conveying the true sense of a room but then focusing on little details, it's something that can really sell the property probably you know, 
more than just if you just had the standard standing in the middle of the room shot for every single one. Okay, and then also you can use framing elements within the interior of a space, like a door or a window or entryways or something like that, again, to convey perspective. Whereas, like, this is a closet right here, for example. It's the same closet, but if you don't have some sort of framing element, you don't allow the viewer to understand what they're looking at, even though you're showing more of the closet on this side, it's hard to really get a sense for what it is compared to this one right here. Um, another good tip is that you can take um, different, I guess you could say heights, within the same spot of what you're taking a photo of. This is a photo of a bathroom that is uh, where I was standing in the same spot, but one was crouched down like this, one was at standard height, and then one was with me holding the camera all the way up here. So at least you can have some options of what's going to be the most dynamic shot to use. Um, when you're inside or outside, a good tip to use is to establish the foreground, the middle ground, and the background. Again, to establish perspective. If you didn't have you know, the foliage here or the tree, or again right here, it's just going to be a lot um, just more boring of a composition. Okay, this is another big one too. Um, Something that you can use, because most people are just going to be using autofocus on your camera and your camera phone. What you should try to do is focus on basically the middle ground likewise, like right here. Because what happens is, if you use your camera and you focus on your hot spot, which is like the window here, or some other light source, this is in focus, but then the rest of your shot is completely in shadow. You don't want that, obviously. And then if you focus on the opposite, which is just the shadow, then you get the huge white spot where the window is. So what you want to try to go for is focus on a, where you can try to get the good balance of the two, where you get the best, um, I guess, collection of detail. Um, another tip is, is to watch out for reflections. Um, especially you know areas where you have mirrors or reflective services. Um, right here, you can see I, I caught myself right there, even though I was trying to hide, and you know got a person right here in the microwave. That stuff you see a lot, actually. And that's all we have for now. Thanks, Adam. Okay, so let's get on to your uh, Oh, thank you. One thing? Yes, yes, sir. Just, I didn't get a chance to put it on the agenda. Uh, a week from tomorrow, and I know a lot of you know that I'm on the Renata Beach Ed Foundation. We have our third annual Texas Hold'em Poker Tournament right here in this room. You can find it easily. It's a great event. Uh, South Bay Brokers is a sponsor. Jack is a regular participant. I'd love to see some other agents. It's $100 if you, uh, for an advanced uh, registration. Food, there's drinks. Uh, it's great fun, great cause. Love to have some South Bay Broker agents come by. I'll send out a flyer via email. Just want to let everybody know. Thank you, Ted. And always a great job. Always much appreciated. Uh, okay, 645 31st Street. Jack. Uh, this is uh, Classic House. Uh,
Uh, we're not sure about this price, uh, so take that with a grain of salt. But uh, I'd like to uh, show you, would like you to see it. It's, uh, I think it's about 1990, and uh, we'll see it this morning. Okay. Rob McGarry, 709 Lucia. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Well, mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, Barry's jumping on. What are you doing? You skipped to. Oh, 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 um, you know what? I was looking at Jim's name. It's all over the board here. Um, shoot, okay. That's cool. All right, uh, 1616 Carlson. Sure. Yes, Barry, it's uh, Tom and Skinny. Uh, a couple of blocks to the Jefferson School District. It has the nicest kitchen I've seen in one of these Tom and Skinny's. It was in 86. Um, we'll see it there. Great. Looks good. Uh, Jimmy, you're back up. 719 uh, North Juanita. We've got pictures of this one. So this is a total lot uh, B unit, got a yard, South Redondo. That's got a huge master suite, gigantic. And uh, it's just a nice place. It's good condition. And I think it'll sell pretty quickly. And we'll see you today. Okay, Rob. There we go. Um, a lot of you guys saw uh, the, when I had the front unit listed, 